If you'd like, you can join me in singing hymn number 346 today. Come sing a song with me. 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 That I might know your mind. And My name is George Horizer. I'm today's worship associate. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the, Unite, the Unitarian Universalist Church of Lancaster. We come together in spirit to nourish the spirit, connect in love, and act for justice. We welcome you this morning, just as you are, whatever your heritage, whatever your faith and your background, whomever you love, however you express gender in your body. Today, you are part of this spiritual community. And if this is your first time here, may you soon discover this is also your spiritual community. And a special welcome goes out to all of those who are joining the service this morning on Zoom. As has become our Zoom tradition, I invite those on Zoom to turn your cameras on and share a wave together. And everyone here in the sanctuary, let's wave at the camera at the back of the sanctuary to send our greetings to them here. In this time together, please do what you need to do to feel present in this space. How does your body connect with the sacred? Move, sway, walk around, for worshipers of all ages, if doing something with your hands helps you to feel present, please feel free to use the materials that you can find in the Women's Memorial Room. At this time, I invite Steve Jones, member of our Board of Trustees, to say a word. I welcome all this morning as well, not just to this space and time, but let us also acknowledge in this sacred space the truth of the land beneath and around us. 
we are gathered on land once inhabited by people known as the Susquehannock and Conestoga. We acknowledge the violent legacies of genocide, displacement, and settlement that led to us being here today and remind ourselves to live humbly in relation to this land and with all of the indigenous people still living and loving on this continent. Many indigenous people will say, all our relatives, may we live into this truth and aspiration together. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our minister for today, Reverend Elizabeth Harlan Shuba. Actually, um, Reverend Elizabeth and I, Lenore Bajardukes, will be sharing our, the pulpit today. That's okay, Steve. <laughs> and um, I'll announce a little change to our order of service, which is um, we have a number of people who are out sick today, um, and in, including our beloved accompanist, Alan. Um, and, and so Eli is, um, I think, aptly covering both piano and guitar for today, um, and so you will have an adjustment to the last hymn in your order of service. So also, I welcome you, and good morning to all. Welcome to this place where we sing songs together, where we can practice sharing our stories from our hearts and find a rose in the winter time. And my, I'm Lenore, and my pronouns are she and her. As George lights this chalice today, and perhaps if you have a chalice at home, if you're joining on Zoom, let us take in these words from Teresa I. Soto's Spilling the Light, a personal favorite of mine. Some people are used to keeping rules. Don't cross the street when the light is red, only sensible. It turns out that keeping rules isn't the same as keeping covenant, which asks us, instead of keeping a bright line, to keep our promises. To what have we promised ourselves? To this moment, in time and place, to this community and even tenderly interconnected this planet. We promise ourselves to the idea that we are each and all human beings. We promise that there is something moving between us that we cannot tame and cannot measure. This chalice is a reminder that what flame we keep inside us cannot light the way. What flame we keep inside us cannot lead the way. The light must spill to shine. The thing you must be is yourself. Unadulterated, shedding the willingness to journey alone as if you are made of something hard and unforgivable. You are human. You belong right here, right now. And together we will chase away the sickness, the secrets, and leave only the open possibility that the future is a space for growth filling the light. And now I invite a little different kind of a wonder box. So um, I'm inviting Steph Santiago, our youth group advisor and member of the Faith Development Council to come forward up here with Reverend Elizabeth and me. Um, and we are all going to be wondering together. Do you have your wondering hats on? So, um, something is not in the Wonder Box, but on it today. And it has little bits and pieces that are falling down a little bit because it's been around for a, a couple years. But can, can, can you describe for me what's, what's up here on this Wonder Box? Our book, our singing book. Oh, that's one thing. And here, it's a chalice. Our chalice, and behind the wonder box is also a chalice, and that's the symbol of Unitarian Universalism. And we've been having a very interesting moment in um, discussion in the Faith Development Council, um, and uh, one of us asked a question, and I thought it was such a good question that I asked if Steph would be willing to issue it as a challenge to all of us here together, and then we're gonna wonder together. So our challenge, is in one sentence, how would you describe Unitarian Universalism? Your elevator speech, your, if you were just meeting someone and they're like, 
oh, I go to the UU church, and I go, what is that? One sentence, it could be a long sentence, I'll give you that, but it has to be one sentence. I know we all love to talk, <laughs> and we can get distracted, so. I will be your mic runner. Can I get a volunteer to answer Steph's challenge? Let's warm up with Shuba, with okay. Reverend Elizabeth. Um, so I actually had to go to seminary to be able to really refine my elevator speech. So please, it's not gonna be as great as mine. I paid for this. Um, but my, my response, my question, or my, my elevator speech is Unitarian Universalism is a wandering road of truth-seeking and meaning-making. Truth-seeking and meaning-making, thank you. Anybody wanna riff off that? <laughs> Another sentence. We can build this together, Carol. I would describe um, Unitarianism as a spiritual community, love, and justice. Those three words. Mm. Spiritual community, love, and justice, thank you. Folks on Zoom, we invite you also to use the chat to share your own answers. I would, um, I like um, to say Unitarian Universalism is one community of many beliefs striving to make this a better world. Mm. One community, many beliefs striving to make a better world, yes. I've been thinking about this for several years. And to me, Unitarianism is learning to do right while we're living rather than uh, striving to do right so you can go to heaven. Hmm. Learning to do right while we're living rather than striving to do right so that we can go to heaven. Maybe one more sentence. Dad, what is your <laughs> sentence? Um, a place where um, I and you strive to become we. Hmm. Where I and you strive to become we. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for wondering with us today. Thank you, Steph, for posing this challenge, which I thought was so good that we had to do it all together, not just save it for the work of the council. And now we bring our hearts to the center. Oh, good. Okay. Hello. Good morning. I am Elizabeth Harlem Shuva. This is the first time that I've been back in front of you. Oh, pardon me. They want to see my lovely face. <laughs> Since you ordained me, so I'm, I'm so happy to be back as Reverend Elizabeth Harlem Shuba, and I serve as your affiliated community minister, and that means that you are my community. This is my place of worship and I am the steward of our ministries out in the world. As a community who values our responsibility to the world around us, life can feel heavy sometimes. So let's take a moment to quiet the voices in our head. You know, the ones that are making your lunch menu or making a list for the rest of the week. Let's kind of set that stuff down. Let's notice our bodies. If you feel willing and able, I'd like it if together we could take a nice, long, deep breath, pausing for a couple of seconds at the top, and then maybe together, shhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhhh
and complex truths came to your mind. If you're on Zoom, you're invited to bring a bowl of water or tray of sand or earth and stone. While I name some joys, sorrows, and complex truths, George will be laying stones in the sand to mark each one. And then I'll be inviting you all to participate in this ritual in silence. A stone of gratitude and joy for the joyful celebration of the Lunar New Year in Lancaster this past Sunday and for the opportunity of our congregation to participate. And a stone of deep sorrow for those mourning the mass shootings that affect their and our communities and that add to our country's burden of grief and sorrow due to gun violence. A stone of care for Tyree Nichols whose brutal beating and death after a traffic stop have sparked such pain and for the pain of all of the black and brown bodies at traffic stops, a reminder that black lives matter and it's still fiercely true and deeply needed to stay in the forefront of our minds. A stone in remembrance, anti-Semitism, Holocaust Remembrance Day in Hebrew, Yom HaShanol, anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. At this time, whether you are participating in Zoom and have stones and sand, are, or let's line up in the sanctuary as you are so moved and leave a stone in the sand for the celebrations, sorrows, and complex truths in your heart and mind. share a moment of silence as has become our custom to let those joys and sorrows and complex truths expressed and not expressed sink in. Thank you. So when we were planning, oh, my mask too. There we go. Now we match. When we were planning this worship service, I was sharing with our, our, um, our other minister, Reverend Pat, our um, uh, lead minister, that there were things that I feel very deeply in my Unitarian Universalist religious professional bones that I'm not actually sure I've ever really had the chance to share with this congregation. And I have um, two weeks left in my time, my, my ministry here at UUCL as your religious educator. And so Reverend Pat offered me the chance to share. And I asked immediately if you, Reverend Elizabeth, would be able to co-create a worship service together to share our truths. Um, because we have something in common which is that we are both lifelong Unitarian Universalists and really shaped and, um, and growing because of that. And we've talked about how this shaped us. And when we decided about the format, we thought about doing a back and forth because honestly, if you ask me to write a sermon, it's really tough. But if you sit down with me and listen to me and share a rose with me or sing a song with me, then um, we build a space of trust and then the truths come flowing forth. And that's something that I believe is possible in community. So we thought we'd sit down together and dig into some of the truths at the core of our mutual but distinct Unitarian Universalist selves. We came up with five points or questions or what I believe. Um, 
So I'll let you start, <laughs> Reverend Elizabeth. What, when you think of the bedrock at your Unitarian Universalist self, what truth comes forth? I am who I am because I am a Unitarian Universalist. Can you say more about how that influences how you move through the world? Yeah, I can. Thanks for asking. Um, I've always felt that I was lucky to be UU and because becoming and possibility, there is inherent in our tradition as our worth and dignity. And this was more deeply affirmed at seminary where I watched those in my cohort navigate the sort of deconstruction and reconstruction of their belief and as it was in tension with who they were in the world and there was this sense of shame or that they had maybe somehow been led astray and and I because there was maybe a disconnect in who they were and what they believed in their espoused theology and I didn't ever feel that sort of thing because I was conditioned to believe that I have, and we all do, a prophetic voice and it's our responsibility to that prophetic voice to hone it, to give it some undergirding so that it sort of motivates and it is the catalyst of our justice making in the world. So what is that prophetic voice that belief in that prophetic voice, that gift from your Unitarian Universalism offered you? Um, well, sometimes headache because we can feel sort of othered because um, I, I think I was groomed. That's, that doesn't probably sound like, I was conditioned in my youth to believe that when I spoke, it was understood that what I was saying was were my thoughts and my truth and not a capital T truth. And so I had to learn to sort of preface the things that I had was thinking and, and w had to say as I had to clarify that they were my own, um, which really taught me a valuable lesson in, in how we meet each other by saying who we are and where we stand. And then through deep connection, figuring out what parts of, our, of that story um, continue to resonate with us as we continue to become? And what are some of the things that maybe worked at some point and made sense at some point but don't anymore? I'm thinking of, a, have you ever read a really good book and when anybody ever asked you, what's that favorite book that you ever read? And you talk about it so much, you think, well, I'm going to go back and read that book. And as you're making your way through it, you're like flipping to look at the author page. You're like, is this the same book? Is this the same author? And that you realize you're not the same reader. That's to me, that's to me the gift and the work of being a Unitarian Universalist. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so we come to number two, Lenore. I'm wondering how you articulate your own truth You've lived a life shaped by your Unitarian Universalist education, and now here you are doing Unitarian, Unitarian Universalism by serving as a religious educator. And so what does it mean to you? Ooh. Well, um, I think at the core of our faith is that belief that we need to constantly grow and learn. Mm -hmm. And you might be surprised, though, to think, since I am a religious educator, that I believe that that learning, that way of acquiring new knowledge, new ways to see the world, that's really important. But it's important precisely so that we can grow. And that growth as individuals is really important, but it's where we're growing as a community that the real growth starts to happen. Um, so I think that actually faith development, I'm passionate about it, as you know, um, but it's for the work of being in messy community. It's for building the beloved community in our congregations. And actually, um, it is the work of building beloved community. So Connie Goodbread, who's a, um, a longtime religious educator, said something that's become a bit of a mantra in professional religious education circles. Ready? Mm -hmm. Faith development is all we do. <laughs> Unitarian Universalism is the faith we teach. The congregation is the curriculum. Ooh. The 
congregation is the curriculum. I like that. Yeah, and that means, it doesn't it, that it's all of our responsibilities to learn and also all of our responsibilities to teach, to grow together. And, um, you know, that's for making a life that expresses what is divine and makes more of that divine stuff happen mm. in the world. And that we do together because we're more powerful together. And so that's why we need our community. And, you know, any time that my, like, rather pragmatic you, you self, um, I love to learn, but I'm also pretty pragmatic about it, has learned something and really stuck with it, it's been because I really needed that knowledge. And I bet that's the case with a lot of you here. Um, whether that's for, as a white woman, learning about systemic racism because people that I love were deeply affected by it and because my faith calls me mm -hmm. into um, helping just repair what's, in, what's broken inside me and in the world. And so I need knowledge to figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. So I've got to go and get it. And then it's not enough to have that knowledge because the reason I got that knowledge was because I needed it. And then putting it in practice, that's where I grow. Um, you know, my hope for this community actually is that we can continue to practice what I and others have been working on for the past couple of years of really taking the congregation as the curriculum seriously and seeing that so many people have something to teach. Um, we are a faith that's in movement, mm. and not just like social justice movements, although that too, but I think that almost all you use believe that the nature of the sacred or the holy or the divine moves through the world through us. Mm. And it's in the doing, the movement, the, the movement towards things that we express what is holy and we create that in the world. So I have a challenge for you. Um, and I want to challenge us to let the congregation be the curriculum, to let that count. So um, sometimes a challenge feels like do more, 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 do more. And I actually want to encourage us to do a little bit less. Ooh, yes, please. <laughs> and here's what I mean by that. So there was a study in 2008 done of women who were working as housekeepers in hotels. Um, and and they, they, they selected women for the study who had high blood pressure and a couple of other factors of health. And half the group was asked to track their diet and exercise in a log. And the other half did the exact same thing, but this time they were instructed to include every time that they lifted something heavy for their work, mm. the walking up and down the corridors of the hotel. There are hours and hours of work that counts as exercise, it counts. And you know what happened? Um, after a couple of months, their health outcomes of the group that counted what they were already doing as mm -hmm. exercise, their health outcomes improved. And so, yeah, I, I do want to challenge us to let it count, to luxuriate in the work of the learning and the growing that we're already doing, mm -hmm. and to slow down enough to really make that learning stick. <laughs> so I know for me, I think actually um, a meeting can be just as sacred as a worship service and just as much of a learning opportunity as any adult or children's faith development class if we take a little bit of time to prepare ahead of that meeting, we slow down enough to notice relationship, and we really listen to each other and allow ourselves to change and be changed in that messy, imperfect work of being in community. I think what I hear you saying is that it's about our intention, our intention, that we can make sacred space in places that maybe feel or we haven't historically seen them as that if we intend on, on what we're doing there. Yeah, and that, and that model, by the way, is a legitimate educational model. It's Paolo Fieri's uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It's that action, reflection, action. I learned how to be a chaplain in that same sort of model, so I can attest to the fact that it works when we have an intention in learning and then we're able to sort of step back and identify what it is that we learned. When we go back into another situation, we take that learning with us. Huh. So one example of this is reading an indigenous people's history of the United States and then people who are reading that, working on crafting our land acknowledgement and then working on thinking about the history and the story that our windows tell. Mm. That's one example of that praxis, that action, reflection, action. So, yeah. And out of it comes this understanding that we are always moving forward. Yes, because we are a faith that is in motion. Hmm. So you once told me that uh, ours is a faith of action 
And when you think about putting our faith into action, what is one powerful ministry that comes to your mind? This is number three. In my 40 plus years as a Unitarian Universalist, I have to say that the OWL program, mm. our whole lives, I remember the cool teacher who invited us to come into this space embodied where I had never been asked to as a young person to come into a space in the fullness of myself and, and in this coveted, coveted safety be invited to ask questions about my experience, to talk about my body. It was liberating and I think I understand now that being able to talk about my body in, the, in that sort of, in that space um, it helped me to understand the ways in which our Western culture have this implicit discomfort or shame about our bodies. Mm -hmm. And I felt healed in a way that I didn't even recognize I needed healing as a young person. It um, probably one of my strongest visceral memories of, of my of the ministries of our faith. And you grew up in this congregation? I did. So let me ask this congregation, how many people here have been affected by our whole lives, either as a student or a teacher or um, having taken a training? Raise your hand if you've been affected by our whole lives. Take a minute to look around. It's a lot of us. And I hope, I hope more next year. Yeah, I think we've got some stuff in the works. We, uh, this brings us to number four. Number four. Lenore, what is our responsibility to this beautiful, ever-changing faith of ours? Ooh. Okay, I think that our forebearers of this faith, um, the Unitarians, Universalists, liberal religious voices, they were heretics. Oh. And a lot of us are too. A lot of us come to this faith tradition because we feel like there is a culture, a space, a community outside these walls that um, we, we rub the wrong way against. It doesn't fit, it's rejected us, or we reject something to, in it. Um, we just don't have a, quite a home and a place that sees things in a more orthodox way. It's that, like that idea of being maladjusted to the world as it is, and that's vital, right? That Martin Luther King quote. Um, and so we build these communities, right, where other people are also looking around and saying, well, this isn't the way that I want to be in the world, and I need help. I need, I need help from other people trying to figure out a better way, a countercultural way. And I think our responsibility is to keep growing and learning from each other and from people outside these walls about how to make that space more inclusive. Because, well, if our learning and our growing and our helping each other out is not specifically tending to the needs of those who are most marginalized and dehumanized by those systems that we're heretics about outside these walls. If our faith tradition isn't really proactively prioritizing the spiritual and physical needs of anybody who is experiencing marginalization in this world, whether that's because of racism or gender inequality or uh, many, many, many myriad other identities, then I think that it fossilizes. Wow. And I think that because we said that that's a faith in motion, right? Then it really isn't Unitarian Universalism anymore. It becomes something else. So yeah, I think our responsibility is to be constantly attuned to um, the way that, that we are being countercultural and especially thinking about um, tending to the spiritual needs of those who are experiencing marginalization outside these walls. It just occurred to me in hearing you talk that the way that we are alike and the way that we are different from other traditions is that we don't have discipleship, mm -hmm. but that perhaps this two-way learning that we're called to do is the way that we build Unitarian Universalism and find new Unitarian Universalists. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll be wondering about that one. Well, we said there'd be five. So this brings us to our fifth and final one. Lenore, take it away. All right. My fifth truth that I want to share with you is that perfection and perfectionism is killing us and being real 
and being messy and doing that together is what will save us. Can we just let go of trying to be perfect people? Can we do that? If we were perfect, it wouldn't make sense to try and be in community at all, would it? Because we'd just be totally autonomous, self-sufficient beings who wouldn't need to show up at all. And in fact, all across the country, um, coming out of this pandemic, or whatever the pandemic is becoming now, um, a lot of people all across the country are, are saying, hey, wait a second, I don't have to keep doing things the same way. I don't have to follow my old habits. Um, I get to choose where I show up and why. And so I think um, people are showing up to a place that they see a need. Like, you wouldn't be here if you didn't find some need to be here. And we don't need things if we are perfect people. We are whole people. We all come as whole people together, our beautifully imperfect selves. But in order to need each other, we need to admit our imperfections. And I'll share a story with you um, here. Coming into this job as your religious educator, it was my first time being a Unitarian Universalist religious professional. I came up as a Unitarian Universalist religious professional uh, serving in this congregation five years ago. And at first I thought, I took a lot of classes about the profession, and, and I thought I had to be somebody else's vision of what a religious educator should look like. And I noticed over the course of a couple years that that was stifling my own authentic voice, trying to be a different version, a better version in my, my own thoughts of what that religious educator should look like. So some of you know, I'll share something now. Some of you know that um, I struggle sometimes to match my sense of time with the dominant sense of time. I think that we all know this. So um, diplomatically put. <laughs> well, I, I do think that it's, it's a way of seeing the world that gives me a strength because yeah. I, when I am with you, I am with you. Absolutely. And I am present and mm -hmm. fully present. And then two weeks can go by and I genuinely feel like it's been three days. And wow. that has caused hurt and harm for me and for other people in this congregation. Um, and for years, I tried to deal with that by, by just sort of bludgeoning myself over the head with the desire to do better. Mm. You know, I'll do better, I'll do better, I'll do better. Um, but what actually worked, or is working, has worked, is when um, a couple people came to me and said, Lenore, I see that you're struggling with something and we really value you, and we love you, and we want you here, and we want you to use your gifts here. How can we help? How can we support you? And then I felt enough trust and enough safety to say, okay, here's what I'm struggling with. Here's how it's difficult for me. And in opening up about that, I also was able to find my voice about the things I really wanted to offer. Hmm. Became more powerful. And I think I'm not alone in that. I mean, the specific struggle about time might be, but um, I think all of us in various different ways may move around the world hiding ways that we aren't fully perfect. Hmm. And I think in so doing, we're actually hiding the best of ourselves too, learning how to hide who we really are. So, um, you know, I think we're at a time when we're really evaluating, like, what is faith community for? And a lot of the faith communities are not going to survive this pandemic. Mm. And I hope this one will. I really, really do. So we have to ask ourselves, and we're in a good time to ask ourselves, what exactly is it for? Because it's got to be real. If people are going to keep showing up, we've got to be meeting real needs for each other, as I think that many of us are. I think we're already doing so much of that. And it means we've got to be real with each other about what we need. And I think that's hard, because being real with each other means being real about admitting that we don't have all the answers. We aren't totally autonomous. So newsflash, we're not perfect and we need each other. You make me think of our prophet and theologian, Howard Thurman, who talks mm. about this radicalized love where we risk something irrespective of reciprocity. So whether mm. It is seeking to know more, it, whether it's showing up for someone so that the I and they can become a we. It's a willingness to risk because change can be uncomfortable. Yes. And messy. And it's that uncomfort 
the discomfort and that messiness where the growth, circling back to our point number one, number mm. one and two, where that growth can happen, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing this time with me today and for allowing me to share the time with you. Thanks for wanting to do it. Thank with you me. for you all for listening. Um, you know, that last point, number five, um, I was talking with Eli about this service, and Eli knows that um, my favorite band is Over the Rhine. Eli, am I using the area mic or the, uh, this one? This one, all right. Um, favorite band is Over the Rhine, and sometimes a poet like Linford Detweiler and Karen Burquist of Over the Rhine are. Sometimes a poet can um, express something in just enough of a different way. Of course, Thank you so much. Um, so this is one of my favorite songs by one of my favorite bands, and even though they're not Unitarian Universalist, oh man, do I feel like I'm in a Unitarian Universalist worship space when I listen to them play. should know some prayers are better left unspoken I just want to hold you and let the rest go all my friends are part saint and part sinner we lean on each other, try to rise above. We are not afraid to admit we're all still beginners. Yeah, we're all late bloomers when it comes to love. Cause all favorite people are broken believe, believe me my heart should know orphan believers skeptical dreamers step forward you can stay right here you don't have to go Each wound you receive just a burdensome gift. It gets so hard to lift yourself above the ground. But the poet says we must praise the mutilated world. We're all working the graveyard shift. Might as well sing along. Cause all my favorite people are broken. Believe me, my heart should know. As for your tender heart, this world's gonna rip it wide open. be pretty but, but you're so not alone all my favorite people are broken believe me my heart should know orphan believe Skeptical dreamers, you're welcome. Yeah, you are safe right here. You don't have to go. Cause all my favorite people are broken. Believe me, I should know. 
This is the time in our service when we will pass the plate and accept your offerings. You may also go to our website to make a no donation online. A portion of the offering we will, a portion of the offering will be shared this month with Patients Are Waiting, which was started by medical doctors and other medical professionals in Lancaster to increase diversity in medicine. They describe their three goals in this way. To increase the pipeline of minority clinicians, make the pipeline less leaky, and support <laughs> minority clinicians in practice. The share of the plate donations are being matched dollar for dollar by a grant from our Walters Unitarian Trust. So you're sharing in any amount today that you feel able to give will be amplified. Before we pass a plate, let us read in unity the affirmation of faith found in the front of our hymnals. And certainly, hopefully it will be on Zoom that you can follow through. Uh, we will do that first in English and then in Spanish. Love, Love is, is the spirit, the spirit of, this, of church, this church and, and service is its gift. gift. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. El amor es el espíritu de esta iglesia, y el servicio es su ofrenda. Este es nuestro gran pacto, y convivir unidos en paz, a buscar la verdad en amor, so while the plates are being passed, I'll be making some announcements. Um, as we finish up with the announcements, feel free to greet your neighbor in the pew in front of you or behind you or aside of you. Um, the plates will now be passed. Do look to our weekly email newsletter, the love letter, for weekly need to knows events at UUCL, as well as on our Facebook page and website calendar. To sign up for the newsletter, contact our office. Next Sunday will mark the opening of UUCL's labyrinth season of 2023. During the worship service, Reverend Pat will introduce the ancient and enduring labyrinth symbol and spiritual practice of walking the labyrinth. Activities for all ages will follow the worship service, including a reception and opportunities to walk a labyrinth. The following Sunday, February 12th, is an all ages services and our chance to say farewell to Lenore, who will, in the next two weeks is transitioning out of her role as director of lifespan faith development here. If you are interested in playing a part in our no rehearsal fairy tale with a twist, please let Lenore or Reverend Pat know. Lastly, we encourage you to stay after the service today for a fast paced and focused brainstorming session about growing our membership, encouraging family participation, and raising UUCL's profile in the communi community, led by the Action Task Force. What is Unitarian Universalism 4. Let your voice be heard. We gratefully receive these generous gifts freely given and dedicate them to the work and aspirations of this congregation. Let us read our covenant together found in the order of service and on the Zoom track. We 
covenant to provide a welcoming community for all ages, respecting diversity and the inherent worth and dignity of all. Trusting good intentions, we strive to live courageously in love, service, and spiritual growth, and to work for peace and justice in the world. Thank you for coming. So happy to see so many faces today. Please join me in our final words. You listen, I speak. That would be weird. You don't know what I'm about to say. Ours is a community in action, a living tradition. And as we close this service with the extinguishing of our chalice, the symbol of our faith, let's each make a promise to ourselves. Let's name an area that we would like to develop. How can we lean in? As sojourners, we have room for growth. Where are your growth edges? How can we all live in the tension between raging against the machine and loving radically? May we continue to strive for a better answer to that question. Go now in peace, being motivated by the rage of change. Blessed be, Ashe, and Shalom. Let's raise our voices together as we sing hymn 354, We Laugh, We Cry. And it was brought to my attention that sometimes these hymns are unfamiliar or too fast. So pa or la is okay. We laugh, we cry, we live, we die. We dance, we sing our song. We need to feel there's something here to which we can belong. We need to feel the freedom just to have some time alone. But most of all, we need close friends we can call our very own. And we believe in life and in the strength of love. And we have found the need to be together. We have our hearts to give. We have our